Um, uh, thanks everyone for coming and uh, welcome to the first talk of the spring semester of the Cyber Alliance uh, seminar series. We're uh, very excited uh, today to have Salome as our, as our speaker. Um, so she's a, an academic fellow at Columbia Law School and a former fellow and affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. <clears throat> Her studies uh, look at uh, how information law structures inequality in the information economy and how alternative legal arrangements may address that inequality. Uh, Salome's current work focuses on the political economy of social data, this work focuses on the legal theories of social data, uh, what legal status social data enjoys, what legal interests it implicates, and how the law does, or maybe should, uh, regulate its regulate its creation and use. Uh, Salome's academic writing has appeared in a variety of different venues, such as the law, Yale Law Journal, the University of Chicago Law Review Online, as well as the technical reviews at venues such as the ACM Conference on Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. I'm pretty sure at least all of us in the room know of at least one of those venues. Uh, she also writes essays and news articles for places like Nature, The Guardian, Logic Magazine, and The Phenomenal World. And with that, I'm super excited to turn over the floor to Salome. Thank you so much um, to you all and to Mike for that wonderful introduction. I'm gonna um, share my screen. And as I'm doing that, um, I, I'll just sort of have a couple of caveats and notes um, as, as might be clear from that introduction. Um, I really, I do focus on data and the data economy, but from a pretty theoretical perspective. Um, so, you know, uh, this is a more, uh, this is a, pretty interdisciplinary group of people. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just say this this talk and this work is definitely geared towards like a generalist legal audience shading into like theorists of legal interests <laughs> type of audience. Um, so yeah, please uh, bear with me uh, with that like framing. Um, so yeah, can you all see my uh, title slide? We can, yes. And actually, uh, can I ask quickly, um, should sure. we be asking you questions during the talk or should we reserve them to the end? And I will warn you when I ask this question that if you give us the option to ask questions during the talk, we will take you up on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to defer to like kind of the general norms of the group. Um, typically, just because of how I have this structured, it's hard for me to keep an eye on the Zoom and my slides. And the talk should be pretty short. Um, I think we have an hour and a half together. So I think. Maybe if that's a, if it's like not too much of an alteration of the norms of this group, um, maybe I'll get through the talk and then we should have plenty of time for Q&A. I don't think this talk will go more than 20, 25 minutes at max. Does that sound okay with everyone? Um, Absolutely, that's okay. fine. Okay, all right. And if you have like a burning question or you're like, I am lost, like please just, instead of raising your hand, just like speak up and be like, I don't get this, um, then I'll pause. <laughs> but maybe, does that does that sound great? Good. Yes, excellent. Okay. All right. Great. Um, yeah. So as I kind of mentioned um, in my caveating language, um, the talk I'm presenting here um, is largely based on a, a, a paper of mine that was recently published in the Law Journal, but um, it also reflects kind of just my larger research interests regarding uh, the growing importance of data about people um, for a variety of um, sort of social, political, and economic reasons, and how that importance um, meets and challenges the laws that govern how we collect, process, and use data. Um, and throughout the talk, I'm gonna be kind of using just the shorthand of data or social data, um, and I, but I mean data about people. So um, that encompasses behavioral data, but can also um, sometimes be a little bit broader than that. Um, anytime that information collected about people um, or information that's collected begins to implicate um, and drive decisions that are made about, about people's lives. So let's see if I can get this thing to advance. Um, so we are generating a lot of data these days. Um, here is kind of an estimate of um, historical and projected total digital information. Um, this estimate is from 2018, so it's a few years old now. Um, but just to kind of put some of these numbers in context um, and just how much information is being generated. Uh, about 17 years ago, we sequenced the first human genome that took about three gigabytes of data, which is about a DVD's worth of data. In April of 2020, 23andMe, which is a firm that offers genetic testing, claimed that it had more than 10 million customers. Um, so 
come a long way from that uh, three gigabytes of um, the first human genome on the genetic front. Um, similarly, the latest autonomous vehicles produce up to 30 terabytes for every eight hours of driving. Um, and according to this estimate here, the world will generate over 90 zettabytes or 9 trillion DVDs this year, um, which is more than all of the data produced since the advent of computers, according to the economist, which whatever that means. Um, so where does all of this data come from? Well, as a lot of us in this room kind of know, um, every year, more and more of how we live our lives, where we go, what we buy, what we do, what we watch, when and where exactly we do all of that, what we might be feeling as we do all of that um, is collected from our smartphones, our smart TVs, computers, cars, sensors placed throughout the cities we live. And that collected data is stored as bits of information in servers around the world where um, it exists more or less forever. There is of course a, a, some degree of sort of de degradation and die off. And where data scientists combine this data from that of other people to train models, to develop predictions and patterns, um, often as a service for clients in a growing number of industries. So what, what companies are behind all of this? Um, some of the biggest companies in the world. So in the first quarter of last year, Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Facebook made a combined profit of $55 billion. And the basic playbook of these companies requires and prioritizes social data. A firm that can collect a lot of this data can make better use of artificial intelligence, attract more users who in turn supply more data. Um, they recruit the best data scientists and have cash to buy um, the best AI startups. And that's kind of the narrative that, that, that is painted um, about social data and its role in the playbook of these successful companies. Um, and that playbook is being emulated in other industries where the race to become a dominant platform is, is on. So that's the mission of companies like Compass in residential properties, um, it's sort of a stated goal of Tesla and self-driving cars. And as um, people in this group is probably are aware, that's kind of um, Apple and Google are kind of hoping to repeat that, that playbook um, increasingly in the context of healthcare. So what's driving that chart of data growth um, is that the social data harvested from our digital interactions kind of serves as a basic resource for this economy. Um, and it's kind of not behind just one, but several multi-billion dollar industries. So we have our classic platforms, but also, of course, a thriving multi-billion backend data brokerage industry. And of course, it's um, that, that playbook of success is increasingly kind of key to the growth strategies in a number of other industries as well. Now, I want to pause here and say, you no, know, I think it would be naive of me to try to claim that all of these companies' value is just derived from data about people. Um, it clearly isn't. Any legal scholar would say, okay, there are changes in the financial industry that reflect some of this growth. There are potential maybe antitrust concerns that are um, monopolistic profit um, rent seeking behavior that maybe describes some of this. So that, that's a complicated story. And I wouldn't say all of this is just like a clear, all of Apple's worth or all of Microsoft's worth is, is data. It clearly isn't. Um, and it's kind of complicated to say exactly how much of it is. Um, a robust methodology to value data has yet to be developed. Um, but here are some numbers that we should take with a grain of salt. So um, Statistics Canada, which is a government agency in Canada, they tried to estimate the value of the country's data in 2019. And the result was between 157 billion and 218 billion Canadian dollars. So that's about 100, between 118 billion and 164 billion US dollars. Um, and if that number is close, which again is a big if, then the value of all the data in America, which GD, whose GDP is 12 times that of Canada, could amount to something between like 1.4 trillion to $2 trillion, um, which would be roughly equivalent to nearly 5% of America's stock of private physical capital. Um, again, I, I don't wanna lean too hard on those numbers. Valuing data is really hard. Um, it's its own lively subject of debate in accounting and economics literature. And I don't really wanna to waste too much of my limited time digging into those debates now, but um, suffice it to say the data economy is undoubtedly large, regardless of how you slice it. Um, and it's undoubtedly, or um, I think there's strong empirical evidence to say that it is valuable. Um, so let's advance here. So um, this data, you know, a lot of value here, but there are also, of course, growing concerns about how all of the social data is being used. Um, and the, this sort of mass use 
causes all sorts of problems, um, again, as many people on this call know. So we have growing evidence of the way ubiquitous data collection fuels not just deeply personal forms of violation, um, Roy identification attacks, um, things like that, but also how the, these backend infrastructures and incentives and uses of data collection can undermine or sort of rupture important social functions. Um, and that's perhaps most saliently shown in the um, considerable backlash felt by Facebook following the Cambridge Analytica scandal in the wake of the 2016 Brexit and US presidential elections. Um, so uh, there's general consensus among um, privacy law scholars, scholars of law and technology that the existing data privacy laws we have in the US are inadequate to meet this moment and that something must be done. But what exactly is sort of an ongoing and, and lively debate? The primary contribution of this piece is to say that this debate proceeds from an incorrect descriptive account of the data economy. So debates in the law um, about what to do about this, I, I, I wanna contend really focus on what I call this vertical relation, which is a relation between the user, me, and a data platform like Google and how our laws sort of structure via contract and background privacy laws, um, how they sort of structure this relation, govern this exchange relation of data from me for services from them. And so a lot of the th ways that we think about reforming, doing something about data and all the harm it can potentially cause is to intervene on this vertical relation. And intervening on this vertical relation generates questions like, what data can Google collect about me? How much value should they get from that? And should they share any of that value with me? Um, whether I consented to the collection of that data from me and what the scope of that consent covers. So whether it covers just that kind of initial alienable exchange or whether that also kind of reasonably covers downstream uses of my data that affect me. But um, this is an incomplete account of the digital economy. Um, there's also this sort of horizontal relation going on in the digital economy, which is not the relationship between me and a company that collects my data, but a relation between me and other people. And these horizontal relations I refer to as data relations. And, and the, the point this kind of horizontal relation is meant to capture is that data collected from me is almost never just about me, but it's almost always also about others. And, Again, I think for data scientists on the call, it's like, yes, duh. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that this is a really kind of interesting and potentially um, uh, profound point, which is that data relations speak to or express or capture the basic fact of human sociality, that we are like one another. So that people like me in various ways can reveal meaningful things about me, things that are economically and socially useful. Um, this essential social fact is coupled with new technological capacities. So new chips with more processing power and machine learning methods and data scientific methods that are needed to actually make sense of the ways we relate to one another um, kind of at scale and to act on those relations at the sort of degree of specificity um, and simultaneously ubiquity needed to make insights and predictions. So the point here is that these horizontal relations, these data relations are really key to how data about people turns into money for companies in the digital economy. And understanding this and taking it seriously uh, has numerous legal and ethical ramifications. And um, as an intellectual matter, I think real benefits for clarifying the terrain of debate of what to do about data, how we should think about the job of data governance as a legal field, and um, how to evaluate and develop proposals for reform of uh, what I consider one of the major components of contemporary life. So why don't I step back and give an example here of what I mean. Um, so this example is obviously stylized. Um, it's meant to sort of serve as a, a, a neat little hypothetical, but it's drawn from, I think, you know, real, real instances of, of real stuff. So we have a data subject here, Anna, who's um, four weeks pregnant. And ever since she began trying to become pregnant two years ago, Anna has used Apricot, a popular fertility tracking app and social media site where she uploads information about her ovulation cycle, her eating habits, exercise patterns, sleep, mood changes, and a range of other physical symptoms. Apricot aggregates and synthesizes all of this data that users share 
um, not to sell people's data directly, which they reassure users they would never do, but to sell insights about their user base to clients, such as advertisers, employment consultancies, consumer credit agencies, and others. And all of this makes Apricot a lot of money. After all, early pregnancy data is very valuable. Um, having a child is a big event in a consumer's life. This is when Anna is likely to change brand loyalties and totally upend her established purchasing behaviors. So advertisers are very keen to be the first to get to her in this state of flux. But this lucrative time in Anna's life is also a risky one. The legal status of Anna's first trimester pregnancy and her decision about whether or not to stay pregnant are personally and legally fraught. First trimester pregnancy um, is a vulnerable time in other ways. So potential or current employers, creditors, or insurers may also you know, be interested in who's about to experience an expensive and disruptive life event and who on the flip side is likely to be a reliable, healthy, productive worker. Which is not to say that any of these entities want to specifically target or identify pregnant people, but that the autonomous systems increasingly used in these sectors to sift and identify candidates are designed to optimize for low cost, low risk people and are thus primed to identify and exclude the pregnant, even if wholly unintentionally and in, and in ways these entities don't um, understand or, or anticipate. So privacy law, data, data privacy law is very attentive to the potential ways that this data flow might exploit Anna or put her at risk and are sort of on it. <laughs> so um, there are two general buckets of response to governing this data flow for Anna. Um, the first kind of cluster or school of approaches um, I call the proprietary approach to data governance. And the basic view here is that Apricot is getting really rich from this valuable resource that they're basically getting for free from Anna, and that this um, legal arrangement is like feudalism. It repre represents a, a legal arrangement of unjust en enrichment. Um, so the intuition here is that this is Anna's data and she deserves to be paid for it. And in response, proprietarians tend to advocate for assigning a property or a labor right to Anna for her data so that she can command a price in a market for what her data is worth. The second kind of cluster or school of approaches is um, the dignitarian view. And dignitarians would argue that payment ignores the uh, original sin of data extraction, which is this unjust violation of the inner sphere of Anna's life. So the idea here is to gain and render legible this personal and very intimate knowledge about Anna violates her dignity, um, her ability to enjoy a privileged relationship to herself and that information, and her um, right to set who knows that information and on what terms. This knowledge puts Anna at risk of being manipulated, um, and it can be used downstream against her in ways that undermine and thwart her autonomy. Um, in response, dignitarians um, offer a range of legal responses, they often take the form of granting Anna inalienable, even fundamental rights to her data that don't extinguish at the point of collection, but grant her sort of further downstream rights um, against um, uses of data that might violate certain core rights of hers. Dignitarians also tend to advocate for higher thresholds of what counts as consent. So to sort of shore up that ability for Anna to provide robust, meaningful consent and meaningfully set the terms of who knows this intimate knowledge about her and on what terms. So let's imagine we adopt one or both of these views. So we pass a law that says you have to pay Anna for her data now, and she's able to command a nice price um, in the market for her data. Or, or alternatively, we pass really robust consent terms on collection, um, and Apricot is now required to promise that um, this data that they collect about Anna won't be used to make any harmful choices about her um, with, with respect to her pregnancy. Um, so, you know, I, I think either or both of these scenarios is, um, I wanna point out like a real sign of progress. This is better than what we have now um, and certainly better for Anna, but the um, issue is we haven't yet accounted for those, those horizontal relations. So how is this data from Apricot used in a real world sense? So Anna uploads information regarding her fertility and pregnancy to Apricot, who sells insights about that to clients who in turn are gonna combine this, those insights with other data flows or other um, insights from other kind of data platforms on users' TV viewing habits and movement patterns. Um, because again, all kinds of entities are interested in the behavioral signs and patterns of early pregnancy. So Becca, who does not use Apricot, 
um, fits certain behavioral patterns that emerge from the analysis of apricot users. So like Anna and others, she might, let's say, exhibit the same patterns of change TV viewing and online purchasing behavior that indicates that she too is in the first trimester of a pregnancy. And indeed, a prospective employer relying on the services of a sort of um, autonomous profile sorter flags Becca as a high risk candidate and she's eliminated from um, the pool of potential applicants for a job. So we can map those relations along these two axes. The vertical axis here, um, on the vertical axis, you know, we've done a, a good deal for Anna. Um, we've given her either a right of payment, which would allow her to exercise a, um, a, a wage or a, a, a property claim to um, payment for her data. And dignitarians, of course, would strengthen consent to protect Anna against certain downstream uses. So she really provided robust consent for this data. Um, but neither would really have anything to say about this horizontal relation, which is that Anna's act of uploading her behavioral and her fertility data puts her in a relationship via this data flow with Becca. So in a vital fun fundamental sense, data about Anna's pregnancy is also data about Becca's pregnancy. In that this data can be used to make predictions or guide ent entities behavior in ways that impact Becca too. Um, so from a sort of normative legal perspective, this isn't just some obtuse correlation, it's a salient relationship. Um, it's at least potentially or arguably legally relevant. It's the kind of information that we arguably think Becca should have a say over um, as, as sort of a basis of legal theory. And we, you know, we can maybe layer in a little bit more information about Anna and Becca based on how, again, these patterns shake out in the real world um, and the positions these two people occupy in this data flow. So for instance, let's say Anna is um, in her mid thirties. She's an upper middle-class white woman. She's been using IVF to try to get pregnant, um, which is why she's uploading so much information about her pregnancy into Apricot. This is kind of the basic demographic of people who use Apricot and upload such detailed information from their, about their fertility. Becca, on the other hand, is a working class woman of color. She's applying to jobs as a cashier and a waitress, which are the kinds of hourly wage jobs for which employment screening algorithms are far more prevalent and where the concern about being pregnant is more salient given um, certain ways that these labor markets are constructed. So, you know, Anna doesn't face those same concerns of labor market construction as Becca. Let's say Anna has an MBA and she works at a consulting firm. So she might face consequences as a woman in her job, costs and setbacks in her career, frustration over the second shift she has to undertake at home, but she's not at risk of losing her job on the basis of this pregnancy. She has a stable job and she has good maternity leave. Therefore, you know, when we're looking just at Anna, it's maybe totally rational for her to feel comfortable sharing her detailed pregnancy data with Apricot, um, especially given the robust proprietarian or dignitarian protections we've granted her in this scenario. And on the flip side, um, Becca might be justifiably concerned about sharing pregnancy data with apps like Apricot and rationally has refrained from doing so. This really highlights the social stakes and the social quality of the relationship between Anna and Becca this unequal feature of their data relation, that the benefits and the costs of this data production are not spread evenly between them, and that the stakes of not representing these data relations in our legal responses, um, they're not evenly born. Shading out a little bit more into descriptive, descriptive specificity here, um, these horizontal relations, they're actually population level relations arising from population correlations and patterns drawn across these groups. So Anna is in horizontal relation, not just with Becca, but potentially everyone in population J or all the Beccas that share relevant pregnancy indicating features with Anna. And the same is true the other way around. So these horizontal ties give rise to population level interests. So insofar as either Anna or Becca has an interest in how pregnancy data is used to make decisions about them, insofar as we think that that's like a thing that the law is like a legally relevant interest, that interest accrues at this population level. It attaches or is implicated by the choices of anyone who shares indicia of the population feature. And I wanna pause here and note that although this example focused on a bad outcome for Becca, um, that's not always gonna be the case. So we could imagine um, that Becca shares indicators with pregnancy um, with Anna for certain pregnancy risks. So let's say um, like Anna, we. Note that Becca is unlikely to be taking um, prenatal vitamins or, or sort of early stage vitamins. 
And as part of a public health campaign, she sort of proactively shown advertisements on the benefits of prenatal vitamins. And she sent a coupon for 75% off um, from a local pharmacy. Either way here, that population J, the Beccas, they have some interest at stake in the behaviors and traits that they share in common with Anna's observed behavior. Um, and, you know, it, it's again worth emphasizing that it's these horizontal relations, our data relations, that are the point of a whole lot of data collection in the digital economy. So relating people to one another, it's not like exhaust or pollution that just kind of happens to arise as these companies collect fine grade information about Anna that they stick in the Anna folder. Um, instead, it's these, these data relations, our horizontal relations are the basis of how money is made in the digital economy. It's a great deal of why data is collected by companies like Apricot and how that data is incorporated into the playbooks of success of the wealthiest companies in the world. So um, what does this get us as a legal, as, as a legal theory? Um, grounding our legal theories and debates in data governance law in this sort of accurate descriptive account of the data economy. Um, so taking these data relations seriously uh, has several upshots, I think, to offer legal scholars and legal scholarship um, and, as we sort of evaluate what to do about, about the data economy. The first is really conceptual. Um, it brings the law and legal thinking into line with the underlying activity that it purports to regulate. So the basic pitch I make here to, to um, legal audiences is that if this is how tech executives and data scientists and engineers and other scholars of technology understand the value proposition of data, um, it's also how lawyers and legal scholars should understand it. I went back instead of forward. Um, the second benefit is doctrinal. So I think this relational sort of theoretical account offers a really strong challenge to the prevailing use of interpersonal contractual consent to govern data relations. And um, all the legal scholars on this call um, probably know all too well, lots of others critique notice and consent based privacy rules. So I'm not new in making a critique, um, but I think this account provides an especially strong challenge for why notice and consent fails, which is to say consent isn't just wrong because these exchanges, those vertical relations are subject to manipulation and information asymmetries, and we're using contracts of adhesion to govern them, which is all true. <laughs> but because even if we got perfect gold standard consent on that vertical relation, applying it would be a kind of category error. Um, because sort of as a matter of legal theory and legal justification, why we use something like consent, um, is because it actually grants legitimacy to an act. I can't consent on behalf of another and they can't consent on my behalf. But that is basically what's happening all of the time constantly in the data economy and how information about people is actually used. So this well, suggests I, the need- Can I interrupt sure, for yeah. a second? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, um, the horizontal relationship a little bit better it, it, is, yeah. is the idea that shared characteristic, the fact that they have shared characteristics of a sort like age and um, gender and things like that are, are causing these firms to um, make implications or draw conclusions about um, other unknown characteristics of B based on what they know about A or I, I, could you just say a little bit more about, about that? Um, about the specific example, you mean? Um, the specific example or, um, or the kind of the nature of um, um, what is being, um, like what, 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 what the um, uh, consequence to be is like, what is, what is, what is the harm to be or what is what is um, you know what's happening to be here as a result of this what is the horizontal relationship and what's um, what's happening to be is it is it that um, sort of unstated assumptions are being made and and there are consequences in, in what in 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 jobs that are available to her and um, and and marketing um, materials that are being, um, you know, pushed to her, those kinds of things as a result of assumptions that are made about her because of her resemblance right. to A, um, or is it something else? Yeah, um, so it can be assumptions or it can be facts. I mean, I think, again, a lot of this is like probabilistic or inferences. So 
you know, maybe it's that there's an 85% chance that the observed behavior, the combination of um, sort of observed behavior from the A's matches what is observed by B and therefore an action is being taken about her. So one way we might make an, a normative argument about that is to say B is being denied a job on the basis that it's she's maybe pregnant, but she isn't pregnant. Um, but I, I'm trying to make a more general claim, which is to say, like, we don't know. Becca, in this case, might be pregnant or she might not be pregnant. Either way, um, the way that we govern legal interests with respect to information about people means that she's unrepresented totally, like her interests are not represented in how we govern that information. So in this instance, one harm, like a harm that might happen because her interests are unrepresented is that she, it, we are like doing the pregnancy discrimination on Becca and she would have absolutely no idea or she would have no way of like thinking that that might be because of information that was collected about her because it didn't originate from her. She doesn't use apricot. A bunch of the Annas use apricot. But because some other way in which she's sort of like similar to them, um, it's being interpolated or extrapolated that she's likely also similar to them in this relevant way and that she's pregnant. Um, and that's the pregnancy discrimination. But there's yeah. also the like, there's also the potential, like uh, I think what's really important to me is to hold open or sort of like con conceptually construct why we care about these legal interests in a way that it might also be positive. Like <laughs> it, we can also do the public health intervention on Becca, um, which would be good. But like, again, that, that kind of both a positive, if you wanna think about it in terms of externalities, there's a possibility for positive and negative externalities in how we're constructing these contractual um, legal regimes. Does that clarify you, your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's weird. I don't see your face. So sorry if I'm like not looking at you at all, just gazing into the ether as I, <laughs> no, um, but yeah. So, you know, I, I think that really, um, again, to me suggests the need, we, we tend to govern those kinds of relations differently in the law. Um, you know, if I, Anna can't consent on behalf of Becca, but Becca can't consent on behalf of Anna. Um, that's not how consent usually works. So we, we try to open up other legal mechanisms, um, other ways of thinking about how we can grant Anna and Becca both sort of recognition and standing in with respect to these legal, legally relevant interests that are being implicated here. Um, so people have su suggested a number of um, institutions to kind of try to do that. Um, they range in size and scope and form. Um, they include things like data trusts, um, licensing schemes, um, imposing limits on de facto monopoly rights and social data, um, enforcing tiered access rights to social data, um, data destruction rules, or agency auditing requirements. Um, all of those legal institutions are a way of kind of legally operationalizing the greater set of legal interests we have in social data. Um, these can also include and coincide with innovations being proposed in the court system. So with respect to litigation, um, changes to class actions, what it takes to certify a class, structural remedies, um, particularly I think in state, the context of state courts um, where um, traditionally state courts have been far more hospitable to um, novel kinds of privacy litigation. Um, and, and this kind of um, Stacy's question helpfully kind of previewed this point, but I think this institutional agenda offers an important upshot for me at least, which is that a focus on data relations and data governance rather than just data privacy um, allows us kind of an ability not to just freeze data law in a defensive posture, um, as if the best the law can offer is damage control. I think done right, the law can and should en encourage and foster socially beneficial data production, even as it helps us kind of constrain and limit um, socially harmful data production. Um, and again, the, the, the question from Stacy kind of um, prompts a fourth agenda point that is important for me because I'm quite a normative theorist, but I think it's a diff it, uh, benefit of focusing on data relations is that it offers us a different normative account um, of what makes datafying our lives potentially wrongful. Um, so on, on a data relations account, datafication is wrong, not only when it erodes that capacity for subject self-formation, so that autonomy account um, when we wrongfully render Anna legible to apricot systems, but also and at times instead when our data relations kind of apprehend and entrench unjust social relations, by which I mean data relations that enact or amplify some form of legally relevant social inequality. 
Um, so in the story I just told, when we strengthen or reify or reinforce the social meaning of pregnancy as one of a, a, a condition of vulnerability by passing back over for, for, for employment. Um, this normative account captures a lot of the most pressing forms of social harm that are behind a lot of the popular criticism of data extraction, but fall outside of that typical legal account of informational harm as like one of individual kind of consent violation. Um, so I could go on forever about all of this, but I'll sort of stop there and, and open things up for questions from you all. Thanks. <laughs>